Uh, I'm Bill Robinson, and I manage the Crazy Chili Farm at Transfiguration. We're located in a Maricopa County Island between Mesa and Apache Junction. We're a small, an all-volunteer nonprofit farm operating under 501c3 tax status on a one-third acre strip of land owned by the Episcopal Diocese of Arizona. We grow and process a northern New Mexico land-raised chili as a commercial crop. And we package, process, and sell uh, Navajo blue cornmeal from the Ute Mountain Ute tribe in Toyot, Colorado. Revenue from these two products covers all of our expenses, including water, equipment maintenance, supplies, organic soil amendment, signage, and food for our volunteers. Excess revenue, over 60% of our total, is used to grow genetically pure seed crops of traditional Southwestern Native American comestibles for distribution to Native tribes and community at no cost to the recipients. This last endeavor is what has recently received an extraordinary amount of complimentary attention from other organizations and from the press. And while this has been greatly appreciated, it's really helped and really helped our programs. Believe me, it wasn't always this way. Years ago, our good friend Laura Ward, the owner operator of 10th Generation Farms in Casa Grande, gave us a piece of advice that we have never forgotten. In fact, its lasting effect has been to make us both vigilant and flexible. And here's her quote. If you want to make a small fortune in farming, start with a large fortune. In other words, the road to a successful farming operation has a lot of twists, bumps, and potholes. What follows is our story. We got our start in the fall of 2014 as an attempt to address a concern of, of the parishioners of the Episcopal Church of the Transfiguration, a concern shared by a broad spectrum of Arizona's residents and not just church folk. Demographic statistics and the Census Bureau, the USDA, and the Arizona Association of Food Banks show that in Arizona, one in four children one in five adults and one in five seniors are at risk for sufficient food daily. In the far east section of Maricopa, uh, Maricopa County, between the cities of Mesa and Apache Junction, where we're located, this problem is exacerbated by the fact that we're classified as a food desert, which simply means that full service grocery stores are scattered and for many hard to find. An example of a food desert, which you probably are more familiar with, is the Navajo Nation, with 13 grocery stores to service over 200,000 people who are spread out over a 27,000 square mile area. In 2014, during the late summer parish planning sessions, we decided to try and benefit our neighbors and our community by repurposing a large section of church property to grow food crops rather than lawns and decorative landscape. Community gardens were considered and later rejected for a number of reasons, including complexity. Then after a great deal of discussion, one of our people suggested we might simplify the community gardening process by limiting ourselves to one or two crops, kind of like a commercial farm. Research led us to chili peppers as our primary cash crop. As most Spicy true foods are a trending item in restaurants and upscale markets, not only in Arizona, but worldwide. Plus, powder made from certain varieties of chili command a very high price, the value added factor on a comestible crop. This means that a relatively small plot of land can generate a very high return on investment. We selected this variety, uh, <clears throat> this, we selected this variety uh, as a 400-year-old land race from northern New Mexico. Ancestors were, of this variety were first brought to the upper Rio Grande in 1598 by the Spanish colonizer Don Juan de Oñate. Our seeds are the great, great, ever so great grandchildren of the seeds introduced by Oñate, preserved by Hispanic descendants of the original colonists and the local Pueblo communities. We selected a variety called Shimayo, 
named for a village of the same name, and about nine miles of where, from where Onyate established his first colony. Our first seeds were purchased from Native Seed Search, a company in Tucson specializing, uh, specializing in Native American and certified heritage seeds. You'll be hearing directly from NSS later today. Additional Shimayo seeds were later acquired from David Art Chuleta of Alcalde, New Mexico, a direct descendant of General Adelante Archuleta, who provided military support for Don Juan. Before we could plant, however, we needed to do a lot of preparation work. Fencing needed to be erected, ground plowed, soil organically amended, and an irrigation system installed, all with no money and a, and, and a promise to, the, to our parent church not to ask them for any. Our solution may surprise you. We developed a fancy flammable document that certified the bearer as having adopted one or more chili plants for two bucks a piece. We announced the adoption program six weeks before Christmas and droves of winter visitors bought 20 plants per certificate for their, for their grandkids. By Christmas, we had $3,000 cash, a makeshift seed nursery for 1,200 chili plants, a fence enclosed 4,000 square foot planting area and amended with seven cubic yards of uh, organic compost and a beautiful new drip system and a rainbow automatic control system. It was a labor intensive solution rather than a material intensive. And since we were using all volunteer labor, the 3K was adequate to get, to get us going. Our first year, however, was not without adventure. 850 seedlings were planted in February on a 4,000 square foot plot behind the old rectory. They were warmly welcomed by a variety of feathered and furred creatures who shamelessly devoured our precious plantitos. We, we replanted only to be attacked again in April by migratory white winged doves. We replanted again, and this time it looked like our plans, our prayers, and our dreams were about to be fulfilled. And then came May. Summer hit the farm like a bull rider at a garden party. The heat was extreme enough to melt the glue holding the PVC parts of our irrigation system together. On days over 110, the ground temperature exceeded 150. Vinyl tubing explosions on the above ground parts of our system became a daily occurrence. And there were inevitable plant losses. Transplanting new seedlings for into the uh, gaps in the rows proved futile. And on top of everything else, our labor force shrank as many of our most committed farmhands headed north for the summer, understandably. However, cooler weather finally returned and as overnight lows gradually dropped below 80 degrees, surviving chili plants began producing with enthusiasm. Plants with 50 to 75 fruit each were not uncommon. We were now faced with a new set of challenges, picking, processing, and packaging. We'd be some, become so consumed by the farming part of the project, we were taken aback by the manufacturing component. By this time, our parishioners had become extremely excited and engaged, and things fell together uh, really quite quickly. Ripe fruits were picked daily, and drying racks were refilled as fast as they were emptied. Peppers were deseeded, stems removed, and the remainder ground into powder. Labels were printed, powder was packaged, and our entire inventory was sold in time for Christmas. At the end of the first season, despite having to deal with a learning curve, a few setbacks, and major startup costs, we ended up finishing in the black. There were sufficient profits available to invest in some new production equipment, as well as to support the food relief and social responsibility programs that had touched our hearts in the first place. Our growing revenues from the little field enabled us to provide financing for 100% of the meals for a 16 bed uh, uh, women's shelter in Apache Junction, selected school supplies for a local elementary school, thousands of dollars in grants to the feeding agencies of two food banks that funded 27,000 meals that first year, English as a second language training program for refugees in our local areas, funding for a school in Honduras, and funding for 20,000 meals for hurricane relief in the Gulf states. 
The creation of an agreement with United Food Bank rounded out the year pro to provide funding for their distribution agencies, the soup kitchens, the box programs, this sort of thing. Our farming got better in subsequent years, and we started doing an annual harvest festival to promote the farm to generate more revenue. It included a farmer's market, live music, a very competitive chili cook-off, and a kid's event, including an art booth, a petting zoo, and Clydesdale wagon rides provided by Laura Ward of 10th Generation Farms. Then in 2017, everything changed. Two things happened that season, which caused a major course correction. Uh, first, we were stricken with fus uh, fusarium wilt, which measurably reduced our annual chili yield. The cause, our own fault. We'd always grown the same crop in the same location. We couldn't rotate crops with another field because there was no other field. And second, we attended the first ever Arizona Food Summit sponsored by the Arizona Department of Agriculture under the direction of Mark Killian. We solved the first issue, the need to rotate our crops, by expanding our growing surface. Due west of our original field was an unused 6,000 square foot gravel parking lot. Once approvals were obtained, we ripped the lot with a rented tractor, dragged out literally tons of rock, added 12 cubic feet of organic compost, and disked it uh, with Laura's team of horses, uh, uh, the, the Clydesdale team. And we named it field number two. Uh, on your uh, the video that's running behind us, you can see Laura's Laura's Clydesdales. Uh, Laura's Clydesdales also left us a, uh, a gift that continues to uh, uh, to give over the years. Uh, they had been feeding on Bermuda grass, and they left us a, a very very nice uh, uh, deposit of that, which we have to deal with now. Uh, now that we could rotate the chilies and grow something else in field number one, that something else appeared almost miraculously at the food summit our second event that year. And learning of the immense difficulties faced by Native American farmers attempting to redevelop the vast agricultural network that had, had existed prior to the rest of us, us being the descendants of the European colonists who deprived them of their water, their food, their languages, and their culture. I heard the voice of one of the attendees, Psst, hey, you want to grow some beans? The voice belonged to Nina Sayuvek, who with her partner, Sterling Johnson, a Tohono O'odham, who together run the Ajo Center for Sustainable Agriculture uh, at the Ajo Ca uh, Indigenous Cafe. After some discussion, Nina gave us a handful of tepary beans, which we ended up planting at the Crazy Chili Farm with great success. In fact, the little beans were so prolific, we were able to return over a pound of uncrossed seed to Nina and Sterling and still have enough to replant ourselves. More importantly, this little handful awakened us to the opportunity of using our expanded cropland to grow Native American comestibles, not only to provide food for people, but to rematriate traditional seeds to tribal communities working to regenerate traditional and culturally relevant agriculture. This opportunity soon became both the motivation and the mission of our entire operation, which we restructured completely over the following winter. We set up a governing council, which we named the Chili Board, to help with the management of the farm. Then after becoming aware of how large the demand was for uncrossed Native American seeds, we actively looked for other growers willing to work with us to increase our seed inventories. Despite our new and larger growing surface, we couldn't hope to accommodate even a small portion of the seeds needed by native nations and communities. Nor could we be of much help to tribes located in dramatically different climate zones than our low desert hot box. Seeds grown successfully at 1300 feet where temperatures routinely exceed 110 become problematic at higher and cooler elevations. Plus something that had never occurred to us became a major issue that required our utmost understanding and sensitivity, seed sovereignty. Simply stated, seeds are regarded 
entirely differently by Native Americans than by the Western culture that came to dominate them. Corporate America regards seeds as a commodity, a property to be bought and sold and to be genetic, genetically manipulated to increase value. In contrast, Natives view seeds as responsive beings that are inherently embedded within physical and spiritual webs of kinship. Seeds are living relatives, not property, and relatives should not be molested, contaminated, or imprisoned. Seeds are often described as intergenerational intergener relatives, both as children that need nurturing and protecting, and as grandparents who contain cultural wisdom that needs guarding. The only comparison I can think of in Western colonial culture is the bread offered at communion, a tangible entity that is said to feed both the body and the spirit. Native Americans look at, at, at food in general and specifically at seeds as feeding both the body and the spirit. So, equipped with a second field and a lot of information, we dived into 2018. A new storage logic tent frame greenhouse allowed us to start our own chili seedlings in early January. A relationship was developed with a new tribal farm in Colorado that allowed us to profitably market blue cornmeal. And most importantly, we were able to set up seed exchange relationships with organic growers in three states who were much larger than our operation. With the expanded growing, cir uh, oh, excuse me, as with the expanded growing sur uh, surface, 2018 and 19 be turned out to be our most productive ever. But it was 2020 and the astounding reaction of our volunteers to the COVID-19 panic that became an unexpected vector of growth, both for the farm and for our relationship with Native American communities and other growers and organizations who we now regard as partners. As most of you are well aware, the pandemic went through indigenous communities of the Southwest like a wrecking ball. By March, we were receiving frequent requests for assistance from tribal authorities in Arizona and New Mexico, the hardest hit regions. Native Health in Phoenix alerted us to many of the problem areas. They're the organization that provides physical and mental health care, job assistance, legal assistance, and food assistance for the 32,000 urban Native Americans in the Valley of the Sun. Then, from March of 2020 through January of this year, the Crazy Chili Farm became not only a grower, but an impromptu relief provider for Native Americans. The relief efforts have been almost continuous. But in respect to our time here, I'll give you two examples of the more interesting programs that we were able to spearhead. In early March, the Crazy Chili Farm received a message uh, in early March of 2020. Yeah, 2020. Uh, the Crazy Chili Farm received a message from the Havasupai capital of Supai Village at the bottom of the Grand Canyon, a plea relayed to us by Native Health in Phoenix. Their chair, chairwoman said that our 36 farmers need seed for spring planting. Can you help? To make a long story short, the answer was yes. Our own limited inventory of Native American seeds was combined with seeds from our partner growers and prepared for shipment. So far, so good. But now there was one more hoop to jump through. The only way to send supplies to the sequestered occupants of Supai Village was the weekly UPS mule train via the eight and a half mile trail from the rim of the Grand Canyon down to Supai Village. Yep, the four legged kind of mules that eat oats and are known for their stubborn nature. But with a lot of help from our friends, we were able to pull it off. But then, wouldn't you know it? The Havasupai were sequestered again this year and with even greater need for seeds. But the small farm and garden community once again stepped up to the plate. Terry Button, uh, one of the owners of Ramona Farms on the Gila River Reservation in Sacketon, Arizona, produced a box of rare Supai red chin mark hun or maize 
Simon Martinez of the Ute Mountain Ute Farm in uh, Toyot, Colorado, provided eight pounds of Navajo blue maize seed. The Crazy Chili Farm added a pound each of Paiute yellow and Pueblo blue speckled tepary beans, plus a half pound of uh, sorghum seed and three ounces of uh, chili seeds. And Native Seed Search in Tucson gave a generous supply of Pima squash and Hopi cassava melon seed. Carefully organized and packed, the assembled seeds were turned over to the uh, United States Post Office mule skinners for the eight and a half mile trip down to Supai Village for a second time. In stark contrast to the mule train, the second interesting program was an airlift from Mesa's Falcon Field to Kingman. This happened in response to an urgent plea from Candida Hunter of the Wallapai tribe, tribal nation. At the time, the Wallapai had the highest rate of COVID contagion in the country. The reservation store in Pete Springs was out of everything, and people were desperate in desperate need of everything from diapers to baby formula to feed uh, and feed for their livestock. While our role ended up being primarily organizational, we were able to come up with four cases of our own blue cornmeal. We also collected and staged donations from three different Valley churches and served as the interface uh, with Angel Flight West in San Diego. Uh, San Diego uh, uh, came up with 12 aircraft that came into, uh, uh, into Falcon Field and we were able to haul the full 1,250 pounds of donated supplies from Mesa to Kingman Airport at no charge. In Kingman, the planes were met by a convoy of pickup trucks and the supplies were hauled to their final destination in Peach Springs. The farm also arranged to have a full flatbed of hay and livestock feed delivered from Mojave, Arizona to the Wallapai Reservation, thanks to a given to us by Mark Killian, the director of the Arizona Department of Agriculture, who I mentioned earlier. Once the second mule train headed down the trail, we returned to our normal activity, growing crops of rare Native American comestibles and growing our viable seed inventories in preparation for rematriation to tribal communities in three states. Already this year, we have shipped significant seed poundage of Navajo blue maize, Uemi blue maize, three kinds of tepary beans, Tohono Atam Har, which is a type of Kushaw squash, Hopi cassava melons, Campo Dorado chilies, uh, that's a registered chili, by the way, that we uh, that we developed ourselves, and Gila red, uh, red and black sorghum. So far this year, we have prepared both fields and the extension for spring planting. Uh, last Saturday, we staged a work day for volunteers. Field number one and the extension were fully planted, and 60% of the chili seedlings were planted in the rest of the field and will be planted next week. Plus, processed package, uh, we pl processed, packaged, and sold 500 pound and a half bags of Navajo blue cornmeal for five bucks each, and shipped and delivered seeds to coffee pot farms, Chichia farms on the Navajo Nation, Ramona farms on the Gila River, Akimo Atam Nation, Native Seed Search as part of a seed exchange program, now Woody Deshone Community Farm at San Carlos, Good Shepherd Community Garden in Fort Defiance. Uh, St. Christopher's Diné Farm in Bluff, Utah, and, have a, uh, and to the Havasupai, as mentioned earlier. Thus, we begin our eighth growing season. We've gotten this far by the help, a lot of help from some really astounding volunteers and a group of remarkably patient and forgiving fellow growers, and a lot of luck. It has been a distinct pleasure to share our story with you today and wish you all a great year and a great conference. On behalf of the Chili Farm, thank you all. Thank you so, so much, Bill. Um, for everyone that is listening, um, Bill has uh, created a flyer. Of commonly asked questions. And so what we're going to do is uh bill if you want to uh go through these questions and then for everyone sure. that's on the line if you have any questions 
um, we will answer those. Uh, we do have, it looks like, one or two questions already, but we'll uh, we'll have you finish uh, these six, Bill, and then we'll jump into uh, bigger questions from everyone else. Okay. Uh, you may have noticed if you were watching the background uh, uh, slides that we're running that uh, when we plant seeds and seedlings, we normally cover them with Dixie cups. So the first question I have is, uh, what are the Dixie cups for? And I'd be happy to explain that. Then uh, uh, something we hear all the time is a 501c3 tax status important for a small business operation. If so, how do we get it? Uh, and I can help you with that. Most nonprofit gardens fall, fail within a few years. Uh, and we are asked, how have we at lasted for eight years? And how do we maintain a volunteer workforce? Uh, the fourth question would be, uh, how do you, that I hear often, is how do you distribute over 600 pounds of seed every year when you only produce 100 pounds? Good question. How can you maintain your nonprofit status when your income exceeds your expenses by 10 to 1? That's another good one. What is the best low-cost way to advertise and promote your farm? So th those are the questions that I get asked all the time. Uh, and uh, if you would like answers to any of those, let me know on the chat and I'll, I'll, I'll do my best to uh, get you a quickie. Hello? <laughs> oh, sorry, everyone. Chat, if you want to go ahead and put the number, um, if any of those six are ones you want Bill to answer, just put that in the chat. But I do have one question right now uh it says bill i really love everything you were talking about would you say that growing your own food is a good way to build kinship and make connections within our communities thank you for that question okay you want me to answer that one now or <laughs> uh yeah go for it. uh that's in some ways that's the uh uh the key to the growth, that, the real growth that we've experienced is uh, uh, once we got into the growing of seeds, uh, our our primary mission was to give it away as fast as we possibly could. Uh, and we found that the more we gave it away and the more connections we developed, uh, the word kind of spread and, and lots of other pe people were brought to our attention uh, in even more desperate need uh, of, of, of the seeds. Uh, we've worked closely with a lot of really good people. Native Seed Search uh, has been very, very helpful to us, and we have developed some strong personal relationships there. We still do what's called a seed exchange with them, where they give us a certain amount of seeds, and we give them a threefold return on those uh, seeds, uh, and, and then use the rest for, for either distribution or regrowing ourselves. Uh, it's uh, it's also had uh, uh, had had a, a kind of a remarkable side effect. Uh, we're growing virtually everything that we regrow the following year, so we don't have any expenses for seeds. And and, and if and the bigger you get, the more expensive seeds will become, or the bigger uh, the factor of the expense for seeds will, will come for your farm. Uh, so that that's. That's fairly important, but yes, uh, the interpersonal relationships that have developed uh, have been very, very touching. And as those interpersonal relationships develop, uh, our volunteers are, are really enriched. Uh, you'll find if you're running a nonprofit that the biggest single problem you'll ever have is labor. Uh, how do you keep a, a, a labor force uh, active and engaged and interested uh, if they're not uh, uh, being paid. And we don't pay uh, anything for our labor, laborers, but we try and take care of them as well as we possibly can. And we share the information and we share the comments we get back from not only our growing partners, but our, uh, the people that receive our seeds uh, with, our, with our own growing staff. And, and they're very touched by that and they're very excited by that. And it keeps them uh, uh, keeps them motivated, and from a management standpoint, it keeps them available to uh, uh, to help us uh, with our work. Okay. Perfect. Uh, really.
Um, it looks like in the chat, Bill, uh, everyone is, is pretty much interested in you answering all of these questions. Uh, okay. So okay. if you want to just uh, run through them, um, and then we do have one or two more questions. And we do have, um, it looks like, just so everyone knows, uh, we have another seven uh, minutes uh, of, of Bill for like answering questions. So maybe that gives you a little bit of timeline there, Bill, like maybe okay. 30 seconds per question if possible. So uh, can I do these uh, via, via the audio then? or, or um, Yeah, go for it. If you want to okay. answer them right okay. now, that works. Uh, the Dixie Cups. The Dixie <laughs> Cups uh, were a low-cost solution uh, to a problem that we had very early on. Uh, we were putting our, our seeds in the ground, and uh, as soon as the sprouts came up, uh, they became bird food. Uh, we had a number. We also had some birds uh, that it would dig up the seeds, like the curved bill thrasher. Uh, once we put in tepary beans and the thrashers came through uh, on three 90-foot rows and had a grand feast and we didn't get a single bean out of it. Uh, we tried putting uh, uh, frameworks with screens over them that were portable, but the birds would get under that and would go on and... Uh, uh, and get caught under there, and the, and the birds were getting killed, and we didn't want that. So finally, uh, it, it was just kind of a wild idea. I, I bought some uh, uh, some cheap paper Dixie cups at uh, uh, Walmart, at, or at uh, no Wally World, at, at uh, and cut the bottoms out of them with an Exacto knife, and put uh, tie wire. Uh, through the lips, and then I took the wide end, and we positioned them over the uh, either the, the the seedling or this where the seed was planted, and uh, poked in the wires so they wouldn't blow away. And they did two things. They first of all they did protect them from all critters. Uh, the only problem we've ever had with that is sometimes we've had rabbits that would start eating everything that came above the top of the cup. Uh, the other thing that happens is uh, we we try and do our first season planting as soon after the frost the, the regular frost free date as we possibly can. Sometimes uh, the mother nature doesn't always remember what the frost free date was, and we get some uh, late frost. And seedlings that are below the lip of the cup will be completely protected. They're in a cozy little. Uh, uh, warm castle of their own, and uh, they're not bothered by that. So, so we've cut our losses in two ways, both critter losses and from uh, uh, weather losses by using the Dixie Cups. The Dixie Cups will last a couple of seasons, and it's worth your while to uh, save them. We have uh, one person who has made it her vocation to make uh, set up those cups for us, and it's been a lifesaver. Uh, now, the 501... C3 tax status uh, is extremely important. It allows you to do two things. Uh, number one, you can sell your product without having to charge tax on it. Uh, and number two, you can buy equipment uh, and that at wherever you buy your equipment and not have to pay the tax if you have a copy of your registration with that status. Uh, the uh, if you have if you if you want to get a 501c3, it is a bit of a complicated process, and your best bet is to go to your local cooperative extension office, uh, and they will help you out on that. We were lucky. Uh, we uh, we were on uh, property that was owned by the Diocese of Arizona. And the Diocese of Arizona has an umbrella 501c3 for all of their parishes. And so they just rolled us in under theirs. Uh, and it's, it's been very, very helpful. Now, most nonprofit gardens fail within a few years. How have you lasted for eight years? Well, uh, and how do you maintain a, a volunteer workforce? I talked a little bit about encouraging the workforce uh, uh, previously, but uh, the... Uh, the the way the way we've kept going uh, is really sort of twofold. Uh, I'm I'm a shameless promoter, and I promote uh, our what we are doing and and how we are doing it, and what our particular 
uh, niches uh, uh, on on Facebook. And I know a lot of people don't like Facebook, but we have not had problem with people coming in and 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 uh, and creating problems or getting political or getting religious or whatever. Uh, we've we've kept it uh, very plant oriented. And Facebook has been extremely helpful uh, in uh, in promoting what we do. About between fifty percent and three quarters of our regular volunteers uh, have been attracted to us uh, by Facebook, uh, not through the church or anything else. So uh, we feel really uh, excited about that and 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 very happy. Uh, and if you maintain a good uh, volunteer labor force, you're you are absolutely positioned for success as as a nonprofit farm. The other thing is uh, you can uh, uh, if you are processing anything like we make chili powder and we grind uh, uh, corn kernels for cornmeal. Uh, if you're processing any of those things, you might fall under the regulations. Uh, uh, for inspection and this sort of thing from the Department of Agriculture. But if you are, uh, if your net revenue is less than $20,000, uh, you, uh, you won't have to deal with that. So, and your nonprofit status will be maintained. So you can, uh, you can make profits of up to 20 grand and, uh, uh, and not upset your nonprofit status. Uh, in our case, we use, we use those process, uh, the profits uh, for the maintenance, the water. We we buy our own water. Uh, uh, the uh, we get we get our water up uh, out of the Arizona Water Company, which is based in Apache Junction, rather than SRP, which is the uh, uh, mega monster of water and power in this area, and uh, and so that's uh, uh, it, and it's. It's important. It's important too that if you do this, that you you don't spend all your time uh, going out and raising money. I don't have time to sit there and write grants year after year. I don't have time uh, uh, to go around and 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 beg for donations. And I would rather uh, that our farm pay its own way by making its own dough. So we we operate part of it kind of like a commercial farm. We have we have cash crops. And uh, we also, uh, but but the cash crops we grow, interestingly enough, are also uh, originally Native American crops. Uh, and so we don't really see uh, any conflict or or uh, distortion of what we're, our objectives are uh, in, in growing those. Now, uh, I think I answered, uh, how do you maintain your nonprofit? Uh, oh. How do you distribute over 600 pounds of seed uh, when you only produce 100 pounds? Well, that's where our, our growing partners come in. Uh, we work with some, uh, uh, some pretty big, uh, either Native American or on the edge of reservation growers. Uh, we wrote, work with R Ramona Farms, uh, Terry and, and Ramona Button uh, in Sacaton. And they, uh, they're, they're fairly discreet uh, about how much acreage they're farming, but it's in the thousands of acres, and uh, uh, and and we do seed exchange. I I go down and I say, hey Terry, have you ever tried these? And I'll give him a batch, big batch of, of some weird corn seed, and and he'll say, hey no, that's all grow those. And then he then he'll say, hey, you ever grow these? And he'd give me a big ba batch of. Uh, uh, of whatever, and I take it up, and and we incorporate it into our program. Uh, the same is true of the Dragoon Range Farm, which is way in southern Arizona, uh, and they're doing uh, uh, a grow out of seed that we provided of the Oami Blue Corn, which is a Yaki uh, product. And uh, if if you ever want to see it. A, a pretty disturbing story. Uh, the the establishment of the Yaqui uh, tribal communities within the United States came about as a result of the, the Yaquis being literally driven out of of uh, of Mexico by 
their traditional home in Sonora, by the Mexican Air Force who bombed their villages in the 1920s. So uh, they, with that, they lost a large part of their uh, agricultural uh, base and there a few seeds remained of the Oemi blue. They were originally preserved uh, through native seed search. And then we got a hold of them through them and started growing them out and spreading them around. Well, Dragoon Mountain Farms is, uh, is planting about a quarter acre of that variety this year for us. So we're going to have a tremendous amount of seed that will go back into native seed search and into us for redistribution to the, to the Yaki communities. Uh, then uh, uh, best low cost way to advertise uh, and promote that we found is uh, uh, I, I do a lot of emails to a lot of people constantly. And uh, the Facebook, uh, I do uh, one or two, what I call the farm report. Uh, that goes back to uh, uh, some childhood roots in Nebraska where uh, Lyle Brumser used to broadcast on KFAB every noon and it was called the farm report and he'd give you all the cattle prices and the and the grain prices and stuff so i i've sort of adapted uh from lyle bremser and and uh we're doing the farm report from the crazy chili farm so okay did that cover everything <laughs> uh yeah for, uh, there's such a breadth of uh knowledge coming out but uh, we do have a couple questions um and we do have uh we're over time but we're gonna give you a couple more minutes. Um, and just so sure. everyone knows, we do have a video for one of our uh, speakers that's a full 40 minutes. And I recommend setting time, uh, time aside to listen to Isaac's. Um, but we did make a shorter version, but we just want to let um, Bill's answers uh, just keep coming. So we do have one. Um, who's who in the world of buyers and distributors of chili peppers? Uh, and and no. value added products from chilies. Well, uh first of all the uh, the 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 bulk of chili peppers are grown either in California or in New Mexico and they go back and forth as to who produces the most the Mesilla Valley down by uh uh, uh in the southern part of the state around the village of Hatch uh is is world famous as a producer of chili and uh uh and people even here in Arizona, I always talk about Hatch Chilies. Well, Hatch Chilies is not a single entity. Uh, it's, uh, it's, a, uh, it's a location. Uh, and they grow about eight different varieties of what they call the Numex uh, uh, Chilies, which were developed uh, in, at New Mexico State University uh, by a fellow named Garcia, who uh, started working with chilies in about 1910, I think, and uh, uh, came up with some of the most famous varieties, the New Mex 6-4, the, uh, 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 the, the Anaheim, uh, uh, and, and, and other chilies that, are, that are, have good brand recognition. Uh, the added value, uh, most of the added value comes from the, uh, the big food processors, and they're very, and they're very few of them uh, that uh, uh, that do them organically or uh, this sort of thing. So uh, you have a with chili powder, you have a trim. That's the other thing. Chili powder uh, is marketed widely uh, from New York to California, but when they sell it in the stores, it's not pure chili. It's mixed with uh, garlic powder and cumin and and a bunch of other things and they just each one make makes up their own brew it's sort of a composite uh, to to get pure chili powder uh, your best bet is to go online and uh, and start checking it out there uh, we uh, we we do three kinds of powder we do red powder green powder and chipotle powder chipotle is smoked uh, smoked chilies, uh, chili smoked in mesquite, and we do all of that and and market the. We we normally, uh, even though we uh, uh, produce, be, the biggest year we've ever had, we produced 900 pounds. Uh, this year we'll probably have over a thousand pounds. A thousand pounds will uh, can produce uh, 500 pounds of uh, uh, 500 pounds of. Uh, chili powder 
and uh, those are marketed in four ounce bags. So you get uh, uh, four bags for each uh, uh, half pound. So it's uh, it, and then times it's, it, it's a lot of money. Uh, and but it grows, it it goes like crazy because uh, it, people have a hard time getting straight chili powder. They get all the mixed stuff. So uh, it's, uh, uh, yeah, it's, and you can do the math yourself, and you'll see it's a pretty staggering number when you, uh, when you run it out, uh, what you can do, and that that's how you can get a, a huge amount of, uh, of, of dollar production out of a relatively small plot, if you if you figure out the way you can add value to your commercial crop. Perfect. So we'll take one more question. I do apologize for everyone that's asked one. Um, I'm just going through the chat and, and there's uh, one about would a limited low profit liability company be beneficial um, in regard to like kind of how your nonprofit is beneficial? Would that be something someone could look into? Is I think what I, I would say I would say yes, but uh, I would go uh, talk to the uh, people at co again at Cooperative Extension. So, OK. Um, and then for anyone that did ask uh, questions, uh, I think Eric, Rebecca and anyone else, 